Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing part 52, if you believe it or not, of uh, Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights where we take a look at some of the wonderful mods people are making and the animals that live in the world around us. So yeah, we've got a very interesting bunch of species today, not too many big mammals, but we've got a couple, most of them are quite varied monkeys, some birds, some reptiles. A very, very interesting bunch of mammals. So we're going to be starting off today with uh, another remake. We have got the James Flamingo uh, by Leaf. So this is uh, Photoparis um, Jamesy, which is also known as the Puna Flamingo. So these guys, as I mentioned last time, they are kind of related to the Andean Flamingo and they live in the same sort of habitat as the Chilean, Andean and of course James Flamingo. So they live in that kind of habitat. So they all live in the same places. And this bird was named after the um, Harry Berkeley James, which was a British naturalist that was obviously studied the birds. So this is where they got their name. And they all live in colonies. And they actually were thought to be extinct until a population was discovered in 1956 in a remote area. So they are doing much better than um, we thought they were. So... These guys are smaller than the Andean Flamingo, and they are about the same size as the Lesser Flamingo, so one of the smaller flamingos. And um, they typically measure from 90 to 92 centimeters, or 2.95 to 3 feet long, and weigh about 2 kilograms, or 4.4 pounds. And you can see they've got these really long necks, like other flamingos, they're not too dissimilar in that way. But what really distinguishes them is their slides, but also their plumage. You can see they're quite uh, pink, quite a pale pink as well with bright uh, streaks along the neck as well as you can see here very very interesting and they have a small amount of black that can be seen on the wings uh, which are the flight feathers that you see here which was interesting and even though they're similar to most of the flamingos that are found in South America these guys are uh, not as pink as the uh, Chilean flamingo and they have a longer bill and the Andean uh, flamingo is a bit larger so these guys the easiest way to distinguish these guys from the other flamingos is their lightly colored feathers and their uh, bright yellow bills. So that's the easiest way to tell them apart. And um, like other flamingo species, the young, as you can see here, they're born like uh, gray or white. These guys obviously can't change the sizes, so they're much bigger than adults. But they're usually born with uh, light gray or white colors. And what they do is um, their parents or they feed uh, fed carotenoids, which comes from their diet of eating just anything they can filter. That helps them acquire, as they grow up to about two or three years old, that helps them acquire their pink color. Which is also very interesting. And like other flamingos, they're capable of flight. So they can, uh, how they fly is they kind of like run and jump off and fly off. But in most zoos, the, how they keep them outside is that they pinionate them. Which means they, it's, it's kind of the same as declawing a cat. So what they'll do is take off or disconnect the first um, digit of the hand. So that basically makes them unable to fly. It's something that's been a common practice in zoos and uh, for birds, uh, especially water birds for a while, but it's starting to go out of fashion. But um, anyway, in terms of their ecology, they're very, very similar to the other flamingos from the last episode. They kind of just put their head in the water and kind of filter uh, whatever they can through there. What it could be small invertebrates, algae, uh, even small fish, just whatever they can get through that. Uh, very interesting. And how they do that is they have uh, kind of hair-like filaments. Or I believe they're called like um, pomisiae or something. Lamisia mesh. It's like a mesh that goes through. through, And they kind of let uh, the water go through. But anything that's in the water gets stuck and filtered through. Which is very, very interesting. And in terms of breeding, the breeding cycles of these flamingos begin about six years old when they're fully matured. And uh, the entire colony participates in these mating rituals, and then they'll start by vocalizing, sticking their necks out and all that, and wandering around and trying to impress the other, uh, the males will go around trying to impress the females. And um, they will lay one egg in a cone-shaped, like, nest in the mud, similar to other flamingos. And they have the oval egg that's kind of similar shape to a chicken. And it's smaller... Uh, egg compared to the other two species, the Chilean and the Andean flamingo. And they actually have an egg tooth as well, but it's not a true tooth, it's actually a bit of keratin on the tip of their beak that they use to push out. And um, yeah, when they're newly hatched, their beaks are like straight and red, but they develop their curve and the adult colors of the beak as well as they grow. And the feathers are usually white and gray with the legs being pink. 
and then the eggs, uh, the eyes of the chicks will also be grey for the first year, and they'll be able to distinguish the cheeks from each other because of uh, vocalizations and things. So these guys, as I mentioned, they were considered extinct until the uh, mid 50s, and they have been later determined to be near threatened by the IUCN, uh, since the last three generations of the population have declined. But they have actually shown some improvements due to a less threatening environment, so that could potentially be good. Really, the greatest threat is similar to the other flamingo species. is a lot of um, destruction of local habitats, also stealing of eggs. and But luckily, there have been measures to reduce this deforestation and the stealing of eggs. And it seems like uh, heavy rainfall may also affect the species, and threats of productivity in the waterways that they feed on is also a uh, big threat to them. But they're said to be doing well generally, so that's very, very good. So, wonderful flamingo here. Next, we're going to move on to a big reptile. Who doesn't love a reptile? We're going to be looking at one of the species of the uh, giant Galapagos tortoises. So, we're starting off today with the Western Santa Cruz tortoise, or the Western Santa Cruz uh, Galapagos tortoise, or just the Santa Cruz tortoise. So, this species name is Chelidonius porteri. Uh, which is only found on the southwestern slopes of um, Santa Cruz, which is the, one of the big islands within the Galapagos. And their estimated home range is only about 141 square kilometers, so not a very big range for such a big animal. And there is approximately uh, about 3,400 individuals in the wild, but their population has been uh, seen rising numbers due to good conservation ep efforts, like getting rid of goats, uh, helping breed species, uh, babies in captivity. But they are st still considered critically endangered, sadly. MCD DNA, DNA also shows that there is three dis genetically distinct populations on the Santa Cruz Island, and there could potentially be niche partitioning or geographic barriers that separate them from each other. And you can see that how they're um, different from the other types of tortoises you can find there is that they have a black oval carapace, as you can see here. This is the carapace here. It's so black and oval. And they also have this, like, uh, dome. And it can, this carapace can get quite big. It gets about 130 centimeters long, so a little over a meter. Big for a Galapagos tortoise as well. Mm -hmm. And it's higher in the center than it is the front, yeah. as you can see here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very broad anteriorly, so on here. So this is pretty much what a Santa Cruz tortoise looks like. Um, in 2015, there was actually a small um, Sierra Fatale population on the island was described as a distinct species. Um, Chelidonius. The falsetai, which is mostly closely related to Chathamensis, which is uh, related to on the Chatham Islands of the uh, Galapagos. Not to be confused with the New Zealand Chatham Islands. Um, while this, so these kind of two live on the same island as well, but the porterize you can see is, is more closely related to uh, the Floridina and the Southern Isabella tortoises. So even though they live on the island, they're related to different groups of tortoises. So it's very interesting in terms of species as well. Since uh, the other species at Delphosauri is actually related to Horensis and Abragorni, which is, I believe, is the um, Pinta Island tortoise, which is believed to be mostly extinct now. But I think that's just really interesting because a lot of people think, oh, they're all the same thing. But it's actually potentially up to 15 species of tortoises that have all been split and changed over time. And different reinvasions from uh, tortoises from different islands, uh, new waves from the mainland as well. So there's a lot of genetic mixing within the constantly changing environments of the Galapagos. So I think that's very, very interesting, especially looking at the genetics to see who's related to what. And I think that's just really, really cool. So yeah, this one was also done by Leaf. Uh, he did a good job. He's seeing he likes making clones of the reptiles. I really hope he makes more tortoises. I really wanted to make like a Pinta Island tortoise or a... Um, uh, Fernandina Island tortoise. I think that'd be awesome, especially since we only know there's one individual of the Fernandina Island tortoise. Uh, Leaf, if you're watching this, hopefully that gives you a good idea. But before we move on, let's look at these cute little babies here. How adorable! How adorable little babies! So now we're going to be moving on to uh, next one by Leaf and Buffsu. We have got the Royal Angelfish or the Regal Angelfish, as you can see here, is a type of marine angelfish. That is uh, in its own genus, uh, Pignopiles, which is found in the Indo-Pacific Oceans and can grow up to 25 centimeters long. So you can see they've got this very, very beautiful elaborate pattern with these uh, orange at the front, goes into yellow, along with these like uh, bluish, uh, bluish white and black patterns down its uh, stripes down its body, 
along with these uh, bright uh, blue fins here and red and blue fin here. Really, really beautiful fish, I think. Let look at this one since it's swimming. Really, really beautiful. So as I mentioned, they have a maximum length of about 25 centimeters long, and they have a total of 14 dorsal spines and 17 to 19 soft dorsal spines. Uh, they also have three anal spines and 17 to 19 soft rays, and they also have 16 to 17 pectoral fins. And the quarter fin is rounded, and you can see there's a lot of variation with within their range. Uh, some from like the Indian Ocean will have different colorations from the Red Sea or the Indo-Pacific, so there is a lot of geograf geographic variation within them, which is really, really cool. And juveniles, uh, they are colored with a large dark spot, dark spot at the basal portion of their soft dorsal fin. And in terms of their lifespan, they've been brought to living for up to 15 years, so they can live a long time. So as I mentioned, they kind of live in the Indo-Pacific Ocean, so they range from the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean across East Africa through the Maldives, uh, New Caledonia, and the Great Barrier Reef. And the northmost limits of their range is like the southern East China Sea around Taiwan and a lot of those um, islands, outlying islands of Japan. And in terms of their um, ecology is that they kind of live in depths of around 0 to 80 meters. And they live in coral rich areas of lagoons, reefs, and often found in vicinity of caves. They are carnivorous, so they often feed on tunicates and sponges as they move through these reefs and underwater caves. They're also non-migratory, so they live in pairs or groups, but can be all solitary, so they're very social or depending. And the juveniles usually find cracks and crevices to try and escape predation. Let's look at this one over here since it's having a good swim. So in terms of human uses, they're considered harmless to using, uh, humans, and they actually have minor, co minor commercial use in the aquarium industry, where they're kind of considered one of the few safe, uh, reef-safe angelfishes, since they mainly eat sponges and not corals. And in terms of keeping them in aquariums, they can be challenging to keep, uh, but with like, the white environment, they will likely start feeding uh, within days with a variety of like uh, fresh, uh, live, frozen, and flake and freeze-dried foods to entice um, salinity. And the um, hostile environment will directly counter acclimatization and feeding efforts. So, a large aggressive fish in their tanks, such as angelfish, triggerfish, and puffers, as well as clownfish and sturgeon fish should be avoided keeping with these guys so they don't like hanging out with other big aggressive fish and in terms of their reproduction the royal angel fish they reproduce like other fish like spawning and they will usually spawn uh, around dusk or at night and they will act in this like really cool spiraling dance before the eggs and sperm are released into the upper water column and then obviously after that they're fertilized and the babies kind of find their way and grow up and become adult fish and the cycle goes on the circle of life the circle of life so yeah very 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 cool fish uh well, again done by buff zoo and uh leaf so now we're going to move on from instead of these fishies and um reptiles and birds we're moving on to some monkeys now so this is a cool little remake here we've got the ecuadorian uh squirrel monkey done by leaf again so how can you not love leaf so these guys are a subspecies of the common squirrel monkey, uh, the Samari um, Casagrensis macaridon. So they've been considered a subspecies of the Guatemalan squirrel monkey, uh, but they were elevated to um, a full species back in 2009, though mo most subsequent evidence have kind of put them back as a Humboldt squirrel monkey or the common squirrel monkey. So the Ecuadorian squirrel monkey lives around the western uh, Brazilian Amazon, as well as southern Colombia, eastern Ecuador, and north and eastern Peru, where they live in these tropical or subtropical forests that are quite humid, where they prefer to live in dense forest, but they can also live in secondary forest and disturbed forest as well, so they're pretty generalist, but they prefer the full forest. Um, they can also live in high elevations of about 12, uh, 1,200 meters or 3,900 feet, but where they've been studied in Ecuador, they prefer elevations of under 500 meters. So, in terms of the Ecuadorian squirrel monkey, uh, they have a head to body length of about 25 to 32 centimeters or 9.8 to 2.6 inches, with a tail uh, a length of about 34 to 44 centimeters or 13 to 17 inches. And males will weigh between 885 to 1380 grams, so 31.2 or 48.7 ounces. And females are a little smaller, they weigh between 
5,000, uh, not 5,000, 590 and 1,150 grams or 21 to 41 ounces. And their coloration, as you can see, they are quite similar to the other um, squirrel monkey species or subspecies, but they're generally just a little bit darker. But yeah, really, really cool. And in terms of their food, let's see what we've got in terms of food. There's actually not much uh, in terms of food right here. So I imagine uh, in terms of the behavior, they are diurnal and arboreal. And unlike other New World monkeys, they actually don't use their tail for climbing, but they use it more as like a balancing uh, post for them to climb around, which is very interesting. And they can live in these quite large multi-male and female groups of up to 500 members. And these large groups are occasionally break up in smaller troops where they keep in touch with each other with a bunch of uh, calls. And they have a number of ones that means different things. Like one will mean um, something like a bird or something like a snake or something like a felid. And in terms of their um, diet, they are generally pretty omnivorous. So they eat primarily fruits and insects, but they'll also eat seeds, leaves, flowers, buds, nuts, and eggs. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And in terms of their breeding, they reach sexual maturity about two and a half years old for females and about three to five or four years for males. And females give birth to about one young during a time during the rainy season with after 150, 170 gestation. And um, they are weaned about four to five months of age. And they, in captivity, they've been known to live for up to 50, uh, 20 years. So they are quite loved, especially for how little they are. And yeah, just really, really cool. And the cool thing is that they've been extensively studied because they are a standard, good standard for humans. And they've found two genes for color vision in their chromosomes. And um, that makes them more sensitive to certain uh, wavelengths of light, which helps, uh, tells us a lot about that, which is really, really cool. And it seems like gene therapy has also given the humans that gene to adult, uh, adult squirrel monkeys that is uh, producing behavior consistent with this trichromatic vision. So it seems like these guys, it's really interesting, especially in primates, really, really cool uh, Ecuadorian squirrel monkeys, very cool. So that was also done by Leaf. Next one is also done by Leaf, another remake and another monkey. We have got the Bolivian Titi monkey, or the white eared Titi, so... Let's have a look in here. Really, really wonderful guy here. Big round boy. So these guys are a type of New World monkey that is found from eastern Bolivia to an area in western Brazil. And they are a medium-sized monkey, as you can see here, with uh, gray, black, uh, orange undersides, uh, and these distinctive like white ear tufts you see here. They give their name the white ear titi. And in terms of their diet, they're generally omnivorous. They eat fruits, other plant materials and invertebrates uh, while they are preyed upon themselves by raptors, though felids and other monkey species have been known to attack them. And these guys, unlike the squirrel monkey that lives in these large groups of over 100 members plus, these guys tend to be a monogamous species and live in small groups of about two to seven members that consist of a pair of their offspring. And a family group will have a home range of about uh, half a hectare to 14 hectares or 1.2 to 3.4 acres. And these adults have complex vocal repertoire to maintain their territory, so they can basically have some sort of like really basic language. Uh, even that's kind of a stretch. They are, have different calls with different meanings uh, to see, obviously, say this is my land, whatever, all of that. And uh, they're also known for their characteristic twinning of tails when groups are sitting together, which is really cute. And they have been known to live in captivity uh, for more than 25 years, so quite long lived. Really, really beautiful. Look at them go. Have a go there. Um, sadly, though, the white eared Titi population has been declining, even though they are considered least concerned. They're believed to be mainly caused by uh, human induced habitat loss and degradation. Uh, though they have been considered least concerned, and they have been shown to be adaptable to the habitat disturbance and is found over a wide range. They haven't been too much concerned of them. Still, really, really interesting animals. So, yeah, I think these guys came out really, really well. Really cool little monkeys here. Uh, I think I love a good monkey. Leaf did a wonderful job. I love that he's going back and remaking a lot of the animals, just making them better. It shows that he really cares. A lot of these uh, models really do care about our um, giving us a good product. And look at this cute little juvenile. How cute is he? Little round boy. I'm a big fan. Who doesn't love a bunch of good monkeys?
Okay, so now we're moving on to some more antelopes and things. So we have got um, a really interesting animal. Uh, here we have got the Chinicara, I believe I pronounced that, or it's and Gazella Benetti, which is also known as the Indian Gazelle. Is it a native uh, a gazelle that's native to Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and as you guessed, India. So these guys are not the biggest of antelopes, but still quite a big animal. They stand at about 65 centimeters or 26 inches tall at the shoulder uh, and weigh about 23 kilograms or 51 pounds. And you can see they have this reddish buff like summer coat with um, glossy fur. And in winter, the white belly throat fur is greatly contrasted a lot more. And you can see the sides of the face have these dark chestnut uh, stripes that come to the corner of the muzzle. And they also have these white stripes, white stripes around their muzzle as well. And they have quite large horns. In a male, uh, they can reach over 39 centimeters or, th or 15 inches. So these guys, as I mentioned, they kind of live in the uh, Pakistan, India, all that. But they live in arid hills and uh, plains, deserts, dry scrublands, and light forests. And they actually inhabit more than 80 protected areas in Pakistan and India. And they can range up to about uh, 1,500 meters or 4,900 feet. And the largest population is in the Kavar National Park. And in 2001, the Indian um, Chiraka population has been estimated at 100,000, with 80,000 li 80, uh, 80, living in the Tar Desert. And the population in Pakistan is scavenged, uh, scattered and has been severely reduced by hunting. And in Iran, for similar reasons, their population being fragmented. In Afghanistan, they're probably very rare, sadly. But they are considered least concerned since they are still quite common in some of these places. So, uh, in terms of their ecology, they are shy and tend to avoid humans. They can also go without water for a long amount of time uh, since they get s sufficient fluids from the, all the food they eat, so the female. And although they're mostly seen alone, they can be spotted in groups of up to four animals. They're not the most social of antelopes, but they do like friends occasionally. They often share their habitat with lots of large other herbivores, such as Ngali, Blackbuck, um, Shandatunga, Wild Goat, and Wild Boar. And Chikakas, they mate once a year, and the males will complete for the females. And in terms of their predators, they are preyed upon by leopards, uh, Bengal tigers, Asiatic lions, and dolls. They're also common preys, uh, they were common prey for Asiatic cheetah in India, alongside Blackbucks, until the Asiatic cheetah went extinct, sadly. Uh, other protected area, outside protective areas, they may be attacked by um, parish dogs, but also by wolves and golden jackals that are also known to hunt them. So they're very important prey species. So in terms of their conservation, as I mentioned, they're found in over 80 protected areas in India. And they've been creating sanctuaries around India for these guys, uh, which is very, very good. Uh, they've also found in some in other parts of the range, such as uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, which is really cool. And in terms of their threats, especially in Afghanistan, Iran, and Pakistan, they've been really affected by extensive hunting and uh, for meat and trophies. And other threats do include uh, habitat loss due to um, agricultural and industrial expansions. And it's believed to be about 1,300 individuals live in Iran. Uh, but obviously, as I mentioned, there's 80,000 or 100,000 in uh, India. And in 1993, there was actually a controversy erupted with the Jigarak government, where they issued the decree on the sanctuary, which can, uh, had a small uh, population of these Indian uh, gazelle. And they, to allow mining for things like limestone uh, and lignite uh, inside the sanctuary. But luckily, um, this was rejected by the High Court, and the sanctuary was restored to its earlier limits. So that's uh, pretty cool. Uh, it shows that conservation goes a long way. And look at this cute little baby. How you adorable. Wonderful little man. So, yeah. That's our Chiraka. That was done by uh, Didums. Uh, who loves Didums? Really, really awesome. And Genora Pizza. How can you not love Genora Pizza? To my dream team, making some of the really, like, obscure quote-unquote animals, but some really, really cool ones regardless. Uh, really, really wonderful here. And next, we've got by... Um, who doesn't love uh, Phonetic. He's kind of been out of the um, loop for a bit, but come back with something big. This was done by Phonetic and Leaf. We have got the Clip Springer. So this is the baby. You want to see the adult. Where's the male? Where's the male? There's the male, I think. No, that's not what we want. So this is the Clip Springer. 
So everyone's favorite little antelope. So these are small antelopes that are found in Eastern and Southern Africa. And they were first described by German zoologist uh, Ernbrad um, August Wilhelm von Zimmermann in 1783. And you can see they are quite a small antelope. I uh, don't know what you're doing there. Um, they reach about 40 to 60 centimeters or 17 to 13, uh, 23 and a half inches at the shoulder and weigh about 18, 8 to 18 kilograms or 18 to 40 pounds. So not very big. Uh, the coat, if you can see the clip spring, is kind of a yellowish gray to reddish brown, which is very effective camouflage in their rocky habitat. And unlike other, uh, most other antelopes, they have a thick and coarse coat of fur with hostile brittle hairs. And you can see these little horns here. They typically measure about 7.5 to 9 centimeters or 3 to 3.5 three inches. So they, they are typically nocturnal. Uh, they tend to rest during the middle of the day and late at night. So that's, you could say that's almost kind of crepuscular. They are quite gregarious. Um, and they're also known to be monogamous to a much greater extent to other antelopes. Uh, so instead of op uh, so individuals of opposite sexes uh, exhibit long-term partner bondings or pair bonding. So, they, so a pair, like a male or female, will kind of almost become married. So similar to humans and albatrosses and things like that. Um... The males will tend to stay close for within five meters of each other for most of their lives. I mean, the mates, not the males. So they're quite close in it, um, especially since their habitats are quite scattered. Um, ma their males will form territories that range from 7.5 to 49 hectares, uh, which is from 18 to 121 acres. And they will stay with their parents and offspring. So the males will form their territories and their partners will live with that territory. Um, they're, though they're primarily a browser, the clip springer often preserve, uh, prefers young plants, such as fruits and flowers, and gestation lasts for about six months, which is followed by a single calf. As you can see here, where's that single calf? Is that you? Yep, this is the single calf. How cute. And um, births peak from early spring, uh, spring to early summer, and the calf will leave its mother when it turns about a year old. So they have a very, very interesting habitat. They tend to, uh, fur, we'll have a look at the female while we're talking about these guys. Uh, we're just talking about an adult, I think. Um, the, they inhabit places characterized by rocky terrain and uh, sparse uh, vegetation. And their range typically extends from northeastern Sudan, um, Etheria, Somaliland, and Ethiopia, to the east of South Africa in the south, to, again, uh, to along coastal Angola and Namibia. So they have quite a big range. And they are considered least concerned, so that's very good. And um, there are no major threats to their survival, though their habitat is inaccessible and unfavorable for hunting. Though, And also significant numbers occur in farmlands. And of, of about 2008, nearly 25% of the populations uh, occur in protected areas throughout their range. Though, in terms of their taxonomy, we'll take a little aside, they've often been split up to 12 species, but um, it's 1 to 12, but a lot of people think uh, there's no one's really looked into it, so they could potentially be up to 12 species of clip springer, though most assessments I could assume maybe 2 to 3, but someone, if, if any taxonomists really want to look into that, look into clip springers and hyraxes, you'll be able to name a lot of species in them, which will be really, really cool. Um, really cool animals there. Yeah, wonderful clip, uh, clip springers done by Phonetic and Leaf. Did a wonderful job, as per always. So now we're going to move on to some big mammals. Uh, so we're going to have to grit and bear it. Uh, pardon the pun, but we're moving on. So this is by the dream team of uh, big mammals, or big uh, predators. we got Havoc, Gaboy, and Mega Rex Gaming. We have got the... Uh, let's see if you can find the... Oh, this is probably the male. This is the... Kamcha, uh, Kamchaka brown bear, or Ursus arctos rangiensis, which is also known as the Far Eastern brown bear. And these guys are a subspecies of the very, very widely ranging brown bear. So same species as a grizzly, just different subspecies. And they are the biggest uh, uh, brown bear subspecies in Eurasia. They are quite big. They range from a body length of 2.4 or 7.9 feet to 3 meters, 9.8 feet uh, tall, uh, to 3 meters tall on their hind legs. And they weigh about 650 kilograms or 1,430 pounds. They're also nearly the same size as the Kodiak bear 
whether their, the skull is broader than that of the Surrey brown bear and comparable to that to the Kodiak bear, which is partly because they're quite isolated on that peninsula there. And um, the skull length for these guys, uh, the greatest skull length is for males is about 40 to 43 centimeters or 50 to 17 inches. And they're about 25 to 27 centimeters or 10 to about 10 inches wide. While uh, skulls of females are a little bit smaller, 37 to 8 centimeters or 14 to 15 inches. And lengths of about 21 to 24 centimeters, 8 to 9 inches. So comparable to other brown bears, they're obviously, well, brown. They tend to be bright, um, dark brown with a violent tint. But also you can see these more lightly colored individuals can be a little bit more um, rarer, but are possible. So we'll talk about the female while we're hanging around as he's sitting there. So they are native to the Kamachaka Peninsula, which is that sticky out bit from the top of Russia. They can be found quite in the far east and outside of the um, Soviet Union. They can be found in the St. Lawrence Island and the Bering Sea. And they're actually more closely related to the brown bears in Alaska and northwestern North America. And they're considered to be an ancestor of the Kodiak bear. So they're close, more closely related to those guys as brown bears migrated from Europe into America, which is very, very interesting. And in terms of ecology, not too different from other bears. They often feed on blueberries, cow crowberries, humpback salmon, and steelheads. Uh, but in autumn, they eat nuts from nut pines and mountain ash and fish. And in times of famine, they will eat dead fish or marine mammals, berries, or gamma vegetation. So in terms of their relationship with humans, uh, they're also considered least concern, I believe, uh, or just considered a subspecies, so not really too big of a distinction. They're generally not dangerous to humans, and only 1% of their encounters will relate in attacks. And we'll have a look at these cute little uh, cubs while we're talking about uh, their relationship with humans. The first Europeans that went to the Kamachaka Peninsula in the 19th century uh, was also surprised by the size and the number of their bears, that they were observed to be relatively harmless compared to their Siberian counterparts. Uh, but however, in July 2008, um, there was a platinum mining uh, compound in that peninsula uh, was besieged by a group of 30 starving bears. <laughs> well, that sounds, like, that sounds like a movie. Imagine 30 uh, big bears just coming down on a compound. That could be, that could be a good movie, I think. <laughs> anyway, they seem to kill two guards as well. And they're actually among one of the most prized trophies in the Russian uh, hunting industry. And in 2005, the Kamucha, um Department of Wildlife Management issued 500 hunting permits. And clients paid up to $10,000 to hunt the bears. And uh, thus the economic impacts of this hunting is significant. So they have to be managed like that because you don't want them killing all the bears. But they do make a lot of money for the local areas. So you just got to have a balance. That's most things. So yeah, really, really wonderful bears, uh, as I mentioned, done by Havoc, Gaboy, and Mega Gaming Rex. Did a wonderful job, again, the dream team. And last, but most certainly not least, uh, we have got by Narwhaler, the Javan Rhinoceros. So this has gotten a bit of an update, and they also swim, so we'll watch them swim as we uh, look at this here. So the Javan Rhinoceros, or Rhinoceros sonanensis, which is also known as the Sunda rhinoceros, or the lesser one-horned rhinoceros, or obviously rhino, is a very, very rare member of the family Rhinocidae, which is one of the five living species of living rhinos. They belong to the same genus as the Indian rhino, and they have that very similar mosaic of armor there. They look very similar, though they are slightly smaller. They get to about 3.1 to 3.2 uh, meters, or about 10 feet in length or about 1.4 to 1.7 meters, or 4.6 to 5.6 feet in height. When they're generally smaller, so they're more closely in, in size to the black rhino than the Indian or even the white rhino. And their horns are actually much shorter than other species, um, usually shorter than 25 centimeters, or 9.8 inches, and are smaller than those of other rhino species. And actually, only the adult males will have horns, really, while females mainly lack them. So you can see the female here. We'll have a quick look. This is the female. She doesn't really have a horn, but the male here does. Really beautiful big male. And they have a kind of a very tragic story. They were once, most of the, once one of the most widespread uh, Asian rhinos. They used to range from the islands of Sumatra and Java throughout Southeast Asia and into India and China. And they, the species now is considered critically endangered, sadly. 
and is possibly the largest, uh, rarest large mammal on Earth, with a population estimated to be about 74, which only live in the Ulongkong National Park in the western tip of Java. So they are considered one of the most, if not the most endangered rhino species, uh, which is very sad. The Java rhinoceros po uh, population in the Vietnam's um, Canton National Park was declared locally extinct in 2011 after one was killed in um, uh, 2010, which is very, very sad. The decline of the Java rhinoceros has been uh, very similar to the decline of other species of rhinos, has been mainly because of poaching. Uh, so their horns, are, because their horns are very highly valuable in traditional medicines. Uh, and uh, they can fetch for up to $30,000 per kilo on the black market. So that means there's a big, big uh, drive for that. And also, um, as European presence of the range increases, trophy hunting has also become a serious threat. Along with loss of habitats, especially as a result of like the Vietnam War, uh, which happened in, obviously in Southeast Asia. And also contributed to their headed recovery and the species decline. And the remaining live in one, nas uh, one nationally protected areas, but they're still at risk of poachers, disease, and loss of genetic diversity, which leads to inbreeding, which is obviously very, very not good. Have a look at the baby. Where's the baby? There's the baby. We'll have a look at the baby and look how cute he is uh, while well, we're talking about him. So the Javan rhino, uh, in the wild, they live about 30 to 45 years. And historically, they range from lowland rainforests, uh, wet grasslands and large floodplains and they are mostly solitary except for courtship and offspring rearing the groups may occasionally um, occur in like wallows and salt licks and aside from humans they don't really have many predators as adults but obviously things like tigers could potentially take them as uh, calves look at the female here look how wonderful she is queen um but they're quite shy, they tend to avoid humans for obviously very good reasons. And um, due to their extreme uh, rarity and the danger of uh, interfering with such an endangered species, not very well studied. The research usually relies on camera traps and fecal samples to gauge the health of their population. And um, consequently, they are the least studied of all the rhino species. Though luckily, in just 2011, there were two adult rhinos and their cars were filmed uh, within a uh, video released... Uh, in 2011 showed that they were breeding in the wild and in April 2012 uh, the National Parks Authority released a video of 35 individual Javan rhinos that includes adults and babies and all that so even though they are range restricted they seem to be breeding quite well and the population is potentially growing so um, that could lead to the future potentially reintroduction to other safe areas though there's not too many safe areas left and be very interesting to see where they put more Javan rhinos um, and there's believed to be only about 50 to 60 individuals in the wild uh, about that time and none in captivity um and there was one in captivity named samson and died in april 2018 after 30 years of age which is far younger than normal uh which they usually lifespan of 50 to 60 years so it is very very possible that um they could be on the road to recovery but obviously further conservation plans would need to uh, create other areas for them to be safe so potentially uh, large areas of forest with armed guards, potentially reserves, things like that. But they could potentially be on the road to recovery. And since they, but they are so endangered, and they've got a long road ahead of them. But we can do big things if we put our minds to it as a, as humans, and we can protect these species, especially by, um, particularly the best thing we can do is try and spread information and show that traditional medicine is not actually very good and to try and reduce that demand for rhino horn but yeah this was done by narwhaler he did a really wonderful job of making this he redid the code and he touched up the model a bit make it look much nicer and now it can swim because javan rhinos are very very good swimmers they're probably the water babies of the rhinos very similar to indian rhinos but yeah i'm a very big fan of how this came out so yeah I think this would be a great place to end the video so i really 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 hope you guys enjoyed this video i hope you guys like and subscribe Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified about anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye bye